How did you get so interested to make a whole company? Um, that's a great question, and it's so great to see the classroom from Maine and elementary school. Uh, hi, everybody. So um, how did I decide to start a company? Uh, Code.org didn't start out as a big sort of effort to start a company. Uh, it started out really just as a hobby, frankly. I just thought people should learn computer science, and this is something that should be done in every school. But before making it into a company, I decided I'd just make a video and say this is important. And that video ended up being uh, very, very popular, uh, at least for somebody who had I'd never done something like this before. That video got seen by 13 million people, and 10,000 teachers said, we want this in our classrooms. And at the time, I didn't have a company. I just had a video. But once 10,000 teachers wanted it, that really is what inspired me to start what really is today's Code.org. I decided if 10,000 teachers want this in their classrooms, somebody should spend the time to, to make the right courses and to help bring something to the teachers. So uh, the teachers who decided to, to bring computer science to their classrooms is really what inspired me to start Code.org. All right, Kim, do you, can you ask a question from your classroom? Yes, hi. Hi. Um, Namir's okay. gone? Okay, say your name. Hello. Um, I'm Naimar. Hi, Naimar. What grade? Um, I'm in fourth grade. What state do we live in? Um, and I live in the United States. <laughs> Specifically New Jersey. New Jersey, okay. Let's go ahead, Naimar. Um, which of the puzzles are you most proud of? Um, you know, we've made so many different tutorials and um, activities at Code.org, it's, it's hard to pick which ones are my favorites. I'll stop with two that are really my favorites. One is the Star Wars tutorial that we released last year. Uh, the reason I like that so much is that Star Wars was one of my favorite things growing up. Uh, and actually, when I was growing up, I didn't have access to watch the movies because Western movies weren't even available uh, where I was living uh, in the Middle East. But I. Uh, I had read books about the movies, and I was so excited when I came to America to actually watch these movies that I'd read about. Uh, and so now, 30 years later, getting a chance to build a tutorial with the team that made Star Wars uh, to you know, drive around R2-D2 with the code you wrote was one of my favorite things to make, uh, and it's really fun to play. My second other really favorite thing we've built is a tool called App Lab, and that's designed for slightly older kids who've already started learning some coding. Uh, but if you get good from the, doing the hour of code, I highly recommend checking out App Lab. It, it lets you make real apps that you can put on your phone and make all sorts of things with it. Uh, so it's not really a puzzle. It doesn't feel as much like a game. It's more like a course. Uh, but it's, it really shows off the magic of coding and being able to make whatever you want to make. All right. Uh, next classroom. Uh, Anne, can you unmute yourself? Yes. And by the way, I want to apologize to the folks streaming on YouTube. I had a little bit of trouble starting the broadcast. There's now uh, about 50 different classrooms uh, that are watching us, but they can't ask questions. Uh, so thank you for, for bearing with me patiently while we got this started. All right, go ahead. Hi, I'm Audrey, and I'm from Mrs. Merrifield's classroom in Falmouth Elementary School. And we were wondering if you were familiar with Ada Lovelace. Yes, I am familiar with Ada Lovelace. And there's a really interesting story uh, about this. Um, Ada Lovelace is one of the very first computer programmers. And what's interesting about her, first of all, is that her birthday is, I think, in two days. So uh, I mean, she, she's long past. But uh, today, we're celebrating the birthday of Grace Hopper, who's one of the most famous computer scientists from the 1940s. Ada Lovelace lived uh, in the 1800s, and she, as one of the first computer programmers, wrote a computer program before computers existed. And the reason that's relevant is because computer programming and computer science isn't just about making apps and technology. It's also about problem solving. And, and uh, she was basically creating algorithms and writing code without an actual computer. She just had the idea of what a computer could do, and she was writing the code for that. Uh, and she's one of the most famous computer scientists of all time. I also personally think it's cool that the, the first known computer programmer was a woman, uh, because as you may or may not know, today most computer programmers among adults are men, uh, and that's something Code.org and the Hour of Code is totally going to change. Uh, you know, if you look at who's coding 
in elementary schools, it's almost 50-50 boys and girls because girls can do it just as well as boys. Uh, and I hope you decide to go coding beyond just this classroom uh, when you get older in middle school and high school. Do you think you would have been friends? Do I think what? Do you think you would have been friends with Ada Lovelace? Do I think I would have been friends with Ada Lovelace? Um, if I was alive, maybe I might have been. Um, or if she was alive right now, I definitely would want to be friends with her. Thank you. Um, all right, Amy, uh, I'm unmuting your classroom. Amy, actually, you need to unmute it to ask a question. Okay, my name is Valerie, and I'm from Falmouth Elementary School in fifth grade. Um, my question is, how many hours a day do you code? How many hours a day do I code? Um, yeah. I don't code every day or in hours because, you know, right now I run a company now that is doing this work. Um, so, you know, the coding that I do is more effectively trying our own tutorials to make sure that they're, they're good enough and making sure that they work the way I'd like them to. Um, but the actual website we have, I'm not the, the chief coder. We actually have a team of people. There's actually 25 people at code.org that are either designing curriculum and courses or they're building the website uh, and actually implementing things like the, you know, the Minecraft tutorial that, that you may have played or the, our App Lab courses or everything on, on code.org. Um, but you know, I started coding when I was 10 and I never stopped, so it's one of my favorite things to do. Uh, but I unfortunately don't do it all the time. I've made a lot of apps with our little App Lab tool, though. Uh, and I, I love playing with all the Hour of Code tutorials. I, I just made it my own. I used the Minecraft Designer recently. Uh, have yeah. you guys tried the new Minecraft Designer that came out this, just this past few weeks? Yeah. My favorite thing about that is that you can change what the different characters can do. So you can make sheep and chicken that go chase after zombies. So yeah. make sure if you try to use that, you you use, you know, one of the best things about coding is that you can change the rules. Uh, you know, in the real world, there's all sorts of rules. When you're coding, you can kind of design whatever you want and make up your own rules. And that's part of what we wanted to do with the Minecraft designer, uh, which is to let you, you know, do whatever you want within Minecraft. The sheep can not have wool. You can, you know, shear the sheep and instead get diamonds out of them. And the chickens can lay gold and the zombies and creepers can attack each other. Uh, and you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Amy. All right, Justin, uh, does your classroom have a question? Yes, yes, how do we do? Um, Daniel's going to come around and sit down closer to the computer so you can see a little clearer. Hi. Oh, I didn't say Hi. There. Hi. <laughs> um, so I had a Where question. Where are you guys from? Oh, we're from uh, South. Oh, sorry. sorry, I didn't hear what you just said. Oh, Where's I, it should be. Where's the mic? It's like on your laptop, right? No, I can hear you now. Can you just say again? Where are you from? Sorry, we didn't. Oh yeah, we're from uh, South Florida, like Broward County. The question was about. Like, were there any hiccups in like making code.org and the hour of code so big in like, you know? So the spread of the hour of code has been just beyond my wildest dreams, I should first say. So, you know, when it started, uh, the idea we first launched with was basically saying, let's see if we can get 10 million students to try an hour of code. And that was just a ridiculous goal to have set for an organization that was Basically, we, we, we were five people, and we said, we can get 10 million people to do this. And the reason it got so big is just because it's such a good idea. Uh, and so it's an idea that has been spread because teachers, parents, celebrities, politicians, athletes, actors, tech companies, everybody likes the idea. And that, that alone has made it spread uh, to the point that we started pushing for 10 million. We've had at least 100 million students do the Hour of Code. Um, by far, the biggest hiccups we've had is making the website be able to handle all the coding that happens. In fact, this is the first year that the code.org website has had 
no technical issues with the amount of sort of traffic we get. Each year, the hour of code is bigger than the year before, and it's a struggle to estimate how much we're going to need to, to, you know, how much, how much visitors and how many users we need to be ready for. You know, it's hard to run a website that has a lot of people visiting it, but it's especially hard when they're not just visiting it for to look at one web page, but to look at thirty different web pages in a row over the course of an hour. Uh, you know, so at, at at peak moments, we'll have many hundreds of thousands of people on the exact same page using it. Uh, so we had to do a number of things. We had to disable saving your progress if you have a login, just so we don't so that piece of our website doesn't need to stay up so that people can see the pages. Uh, making that work has been by far the biggest hiccup. Uh, other than that, the hour of code has just been like my job is a dream job. Getting to come up with this idea that is being used in countries most people have never even heard of and in cities I've never heard of or visited, knowing that people everywhere are doing it. Uh, it's literally the coolest thing in the world to, to have an idea that you have spread that far and wide. Uh, and, and it's become literally part of the education system in so many countries. Uh, and the, really the message from that I'd say is that if you have a good idea, it can get really big. So I, I highly urge you to not, be, not limit your dreams. And if you have dreams of doing something big, coding and computer science are by far the best way to get something that spreads across the world. Uh, there's no other field in which you can come up with an idea, build something, and then three years later see 100 million people using it. Uh, and you know, all the largest tech companies started that way. You know, we're not a billion dollar tech company, but we're the, one of the largest education companies. And we're only three years old and about 60 people. Uh, and so it's incredible the amount of world change you can have with a small number of people with a good idea, but also with computer science. Thanks for your question. Thanks. Um, all right, last question, Shane, do you want to ask? Okay, go ahead. Can you see you? Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. Hi, I'm Michael. <laughs> Hi, I'm Michael here at Miraloma Middle School. I'm an eighth grader in California. And my question is, do you think mainstreaming coding will affect people's views on computer science? Yeah, computer science is so much more mainstream now than it used to be. Uh, you know, when I was in school, computer science was the geekiest thing in the world. You wouldn't want to go around telling anybody that you knew how to code. Uh, basically, you know, to be cool, you needed to play sports, and to to say that you coded was the most uncool thing you could imagine, uh, and nobody really wanted to know. You know, you just it, it was not the the best way to be sort of making friends and being popular. These days, computer science is quite cool. The president of the United States has worn a Code.org hat. Uh, and has written a line of code. Just the, earlier this week, the Prime Minister of Canada did it. Uh, I, I assume you guys, or I hope you guys have seen the video that we launched just a few days ago with people ranging from Kobe Bryant to Serena Williams to Neymar to Marcelo, Sergio Ramos, uh, Draymond Green, uh, Mar Carmelo Anthony, Alana Beard, Sue, uh, Sue Bird, all these athletes coding and saying it's important. So. Uh, I'm pretty sure we've made coding and computer science mainstream already. Uh, really, the one question is, can we, uh, can we get the education system to teach it? It's now at the point that everybody wants this to be taught and everybody wants it to be learned, but it's hard to change schools. America's schools and the world's schools have existed for hundreds of years teaching the same thing, but our world has really changed with computers and software, and our education system hasn't changed quickly enough. Uh, that starts with the hour of code, but we need schools to be teaching hundreds of hours of code, just like they teach math and history and science. Uh, and that's going to be taking a longer time, but I'm sure we can do it. Um, one last question, Mrs. E from Tolton. I guess I didn't call on you. Uh, so you can ask the last question. Thank you so much. Come on. Hello, my name is Marcus Moreland. I'm from Chicago, and this is Augustus Tuckton Catholic Academy. I was asking, how, how, how old were you when you started code? Uh, uh, when I started code.org. Code.org. Code. 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 Oh, okay. So I'm 44 years old right now. I actually just turned 44 a few weeks ago. And code.org started about three years ago, so I was uh, 
I was between 40 and 41 when I started Code.org. Uh, Code.org seems like a really big thing, and it is. It's the fact that you know, 100 million students have used our courses. Uh, but it's a really young company. It's three years old as a company. And there's about, you know, it started out the first hour of code. There was only 13 of us. Uh, and we kicked off this thing that reached 20 million students. Uh, there's now 60 of us. And we do a lot, lot more than the hour of code. Uh, we're training teachers in every major city in the country. We're helping changing laws at the state level. Uh, and we're creating the most popular courses used in computer science worldwide. Uh, but the whole thing is only three years old and only 60 people. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's, I guess, <laughs> it's been amazing to have something that, that reaches that far and wide. Um, I need to get going, but I want to say some closing words, express, especially for the, uh, oh, somebody just asked me if I could take a YouTube question. Uh, so hold on just one second. I'll take one YouTube question. Uh, let me ask, what's the question? Give me one second to get a question from the YouTube audience. Um, all right, I have a question from Heather Womack. Does everything electric have to have code? And this is from first and second graders courses from Mrs. Womack's classroom. And this is from Lago Vista Elementary School in Lago Vista, Texas. Does everything electric have to have code? Um, no, it doesn't. Everything electric needs to have electricity. So light bulbs don't have code. You know, fans don't have code. Today, most refrigerators don't have code. Uh, but really, anything that wants to be smart, and by when I say smart, I mean you give it some information and it does something differently depending on the information, can become more smart with code. So for example, light bulbs can become more smart with code. So a light bulb can turn on when it knows that there's somebody in the room, and it can turn off when there's nobody in the room. Or a fan can turn on when it knows that you're there and that it's hot out, or a refrigerator can tell you when you're out of eggs and, and that you need to buy more eggs. Uh, so it's not that everything electric should have code. It's more that everything electric can have code, and you can make it smarter and, and have it do more for you. All right, I'm going to get going. I just want to say thank you so much to all of the teachers worldwide, and especially in the United States, for helping bring the Hour of Code to so many classrooms. It's been an amazing week. Uh, and also, uh, just the Hour of Code is just the start. We've reached 300 million hours done across the entire globe. Uh, but we need every school worldwide to teach computer science beyond one hour. Every one of you doing this as students, please make sure to go tell your parents today that you learned some code in class. Most of your parents never got a chance to do this when they were in school. Tell them what it's about and ask your school to teach more computer science beyond just one hour. Thank you so much, uh, especially to the teachers. Give a round of applause to your teachers, folks. Thank you. Bye-bye.